Shalom, shalom, l'chaim, l'chaim. I am ready for a great Bible study tonight. So I'm sure that a few will be joining us here and there. Until they do, I'm just going to go ahead and start praying. Uh, there's been a lot of people sick uh, here in America, especially. I know there's been a terrible case of the flu going around. And so I want to pray for those that are sick. And uh, also, I want to pray all uh, for Amanda and John's son, Nathan, who broke his arm this last week. So uh, I want to pray for them as well. So hi, Amanda, and we're going to get started. And I'm going to go ahead and start praying while others are joining us. Lord Jesus, we thank you so much for your goodness. We thank you that you are great in all your ways. Lord, you are just beyond our understanding, but yet, Lord, you seek and you ask us to pursue you, Lord, and that those that pursue you, we will find you. Lord, we want to know you and your greatness, and we want to become your greatness, Lord. We want to be as you are here on this earth. And uh, so, Lord, right now, also, because you are so great, we know that you are not only our Savior, but you are, are also our healer. You are our Lord. And Lord, right now, I uplift before you those that are not feeling well tonight. Uh, Lord, we just lift up Judy Vackers. Lord, we know that she has been really sick today. And Lord, we ask that you s settle her system, that you bring everything into balance and that you cause her to have new energy, new vim, vigor, and vitality. And Lord, even as she rests tonight, that she would wake up in the morning and she would have a new, uh, feel like she has a new lease on life, Lord. <laughs> and she's just uh, more than an overcomer and she'll wake up that way in the morning. Lord, I want to pray for Nathan, uh, Amanda, and John's son. Lord, I ask that you cause his arm to heal well. I know that it was broken this last week. And Lord, we ask that uh, you would cause it to heal right, that there'd be no more shifting and uh, help the reset that he just had to cause it to heal in a good, solid way and let there be nothing that is heal healing improperly. But Lord, let it be healed with wholeness. And Lord, that is an amazing thought in itself that when you bring healing to us, O oh Lord, it's for our wholeness. It's for our being one. And Lord, you integrate all of us into that individual that, that is standing right in you and strengthened and whole. So we thank you, Lord, and we give you glory, Lord, that you are touching in this way. And I feel like I'm forgetting to pray for someone that I just said that I would. Oy. Lord, help me. Help me if we've forgotten anyone, then Lord, you just cover everybody that is going around with this sickness. And um, Lord, we ask that you would cause your servants to be strong and not to get sick. Lord, give us pre-maintenance measures. And Lord, I thank you that you're helping me to become stronger. I just want to praise you, Lord. I want to give you glory for you are awesome, almighty God. And Lord, we know the son of righteousness will rise with healing in his wings. Lord, we accept that you are rising up in our lives. You are, at, you are elevated, Lord. We extol you. We lift you up, Lord. We praise you, Lord. And Lord, we give you glory and we give you honor and we give you praises and we give you, Lord, everything that you're worthy of. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Well, you guys, when you make comments, I can't see everybody's comments at the same time. So just know that if you make comments, and I hope you do, because when you make comments, I think it lets other people know that you're watching this and that you're spending time with us here. So I really appreciate that, and I love you guys. Uh, I think I just saw a little heart from Amanda, and I saw her earlier too. So, but uh, I really have some... Uh, I hope victorious things to share with you tonight and to give you a different perspective of maybe some of the things that you're walking through and that you have victory and that the testing is for our proving. Uh, I know that I wrote down in our, excuse me for licking my fingers, but I needed to grab the papers here. 
uh, I named this In Hot Pursuit of God's Purpose, and that's where we were last week. Well, this week we're picking up with In Hot Pursuit of God's Proving. So we're in, where we know that our purpose is in Him, that we were created in His image, and that that is our purpose to fulfill in the earth, to multiply who He is, and then to take dominion over the earth. And I believe that has to do with taking dominion over the fallen nature as well. And so uh, tonight I wanted to spend a little time in understanding why God would allow testing in our life. And uh, I, I'm really contemplating the thought about the difference in the scriptures between proving and testing. So if you would look with me, I want to go back to kind of where we left off last Tuesday night. Go with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 10. And uh, I, I want to read this because it's going to set us up for the rest of our Bible study that we're going on with tonight. So in 1 Corinthians 10 verse 6, it says, Now these things became examples to us so that we will not desire evil things as they did. And this is talking about the children of Israel as they were going and uh, making their way from Egypt into the promised land. And as they made that trip, God had to help get Egypt out of them so that they could be ready for the promised land. And then uh, verse 17 says, Don't become idolaters as some of them were. As it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and got up to play. Now, here's the tendency that I want to take off from understanding that our purpose is to duplicate the image of God in this earth and that we are the created ones here to take dominion over creation. That's why God gave us the assignment of naming the animals when he asked, he told Adam to name the animals. And uh, so that's just another part of our dominion. And you know what the scriptural principle there is? That whatever God assigns, he wants us then to invite him back into the process. That's what we're doing really when we're praying. When we're praying, we're saying, God, we know that you gave us dominion over the earth, but we can't do it without you. We need your hand to go with us. We need your power and your presence to go with us. We can't do it on our own. We, we have the outward uh, you know, action of what we're doing for the Lord, but we need the indwelling Holy Spirit within us to empower us. We need the fullness of God within us, not just the image of God saying that we're a physical form, but the spiritual, you know, that we are taking dominion and the truth will set you free. The truth of who God is in you. He is all light. He is in the Hebrew, the word is amet. That means he's the truth. And it really has a sequence to the English word to emit something, to emit a, a light, to emit a sound. It's something that is sending forth a frequency out of your life. And so God wants us to emit truth. He wants us to have his empowerment within us. And he wants us to make him part of our partnership so that we can do that with him. It's not that we have to do anything on our own. Aren't you glad of that? I don't, uh, I don't want to do anything without the Lord. I, I need him. You know, I, I just think of that verse all the time. Our God is a very present help in the time of need. And I tell you, I need him every minute, every hour, every day. 24-7, you know, so he is our help. He, I will lift up to my eyes to the hills whence cometh my help. In other words, my help isn't always within me. God's going to bring it to me, and he's going to shore us up, and he's going to strengthen us. Now I'm going to go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 10, and here's part of the examples that was just mentioned in verses 6 and 7. Now, verse 8 says, Let us not commit sexual immorality as some of them did. And in a single day, 23,000 people fell dead. And we're going to talk about that in just a moment. Verse 9, though, is what really captured my attention. And I mentioned it to you last week. But I want to bring it up again. You know, sometimes it helps to hear things more than once. 
This verse 9 says, Let us not test Christ as some of them did and were destroyed by snakes. Now, isn't that something that even referring to something that happened in the Tanakh, in the Old Covenant, it says here that Christ was tempted then. You know, because from creation, he has been here since the foundations of the earth. Because he is in God, and God is in him. And when Jesus walked the earth, he was very God, and he was very man. You know, he had the trials and tribulations of a man, but he had the overcoming power of God. And that's what God wants to do in each one of us. God wants each one of us to know that we can be outwardly a man, but we can have or have the overcoming ability of the Godhead resident within us to overcome and to that's what we need to take dominion, to take dominance over the fallen nature. And so it's talking here about uh, that it was even with sexual immorality. Now, before I go to this story, which we're going to be going to Numbers, the 25th chapter, and find out what Paul is alluding to here in this particular case. You know, it really is very much a judicial, a judicial book. It's, it's a very good understanding of the courts of heaven. And so Paul is an attorney of the word. He's saying out and he's laying out his case and he's saying, I present to you exhibit A. And exhibit A is going to be as some of them did. You know, these things happen for examples for us. And so here is my first example that I'm going to give you. And before I go there, I want to talk about the difference between testing and proving. Because here it says in that verse 9, Let us not test Christ as some of them did and were destroyed by snakes. Now, here's something that we need to know. The Lord wants us to go through testing but it's not so that he can show us how much failure we have in our life. God allows us to go through testing so he can show us how much of God we have in us that's overcoming that test and that trial. And you could even say a tribulation. Those three words are often uh, defined and used in uh, different renditions of the Bible but uh, kind of like, in, you know, very much in a, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Synonym. Ha! It was right there on my tip of my brain. Okay, but I wanted to just take a moment before we go into the story that, uh, you know, is given as an example here where 23,000 people fell dead. But it says that we're not to test Christ as some of them did. And I think this is a really important point. Paul himself is saying to his Jewish brother that, that are the brethren that he's witnessing to and that he's preaching to here, he's letting them know that Christ is part of the Godhead because part of the strong commandments were that we were not to test God. And let me refer to you what those verses are. In Exodus 17, verse 2, it says, So the people complained to Moses. Now this was at the time where they were about to come to uh, where the Lord was going to give them water. They were without water and they were complaining about that. And so they said, give us water to drink. Why are you complaining to me? Moses said, <laughs> I could just hear how exasperated he is. He's like, why are you complaining to me? In other words, He's like a good pastor that is doing what God has said for him to do. I think I saw Susan Bennett come on in here. She and her husband are great pastors, and they're apostolic and prophetic. And uh, as they're pastoring, you know, they're doing things that God tells them to do. God tells us to do something, and uh, I call it, you know, really playing the God card. Once God has told you what you're supposed to do and what you're supposed to perform or act out, you know, play the God card, then everything else is really up to him how it falls suit. Okay, so when we have a pastor, when we have a leader that God has said, you need to take the people and you need to do such and such. If the people complain, 
The complaint is not against you. I really sense tonight that the Lord wants to give us some victory and some liberty and for you guys to know that if you're doing what God has assigned you to do, if somebody has a problem with it, it's their problem. You know, that really is a good example from what Moses went through. You know, so uh, I, I think that even for myself, I've had to get to a place maturing in ministry where I just know that I need to stay on my kingdom assignment and the king will supply for my assignment. And with that, the king also will take care of the favor that I need for that assignment. And so I, I hope that really encourages some of you guys tonight to know that you just keep doing what God told you to do. You know that you know that you know that he has spoken a word to you. Uh, he's given you an assignment. He's given you a vision and a mission. Don't detour from it. God will take care of the people. Hallelujah. I'm just, I just, uh, I feel like I need to pray right there and just say, Lord Jesus, I ask that you encourage those that are watching right now. And Lord, you have spoken missions and visions to those that are watching right now. I know you have, Lord. So Lord, I ask that you strengthen them, encourage them, and give them this attitude like Moses, who said, don't complain to me. I'm just doing as a humble servant myself, I'm just doing what God has told me to do. And so, Lord, encourage right now, edify, build up, shore up, Lord, strengthen in Jesus' name. So Moses replied to them, and this is the last part of that, Exodus 17, 2. Why are you testing the Lord? Do you see, a lot of times we feel like we're the ones going through the testing, but it's the Lord that's being tested. We just stay faithful like God is faithful and God will make sure that he will cover us. He will protect us. We just stay on our assignment. So sometimes we have to step back and, you know, I, I wouldn't just say this to everybody, but if someone is coming against me, I will either have the assurance and the faith and the belief that God is with me, I don't have to say anything. Because to balance this, you know, Jesus himself, he was led as a lamb to the slaughter. He opened not his mouth. So there is a balance in this. Uh, there is so important that we know when to say something and when not to say something. We need to know when to let our yea be yea and our nay be nay. And then I want to go on quickly. You can tell I'm, wa I'm, uh, I'm walking, I'm talking fast. <laughs> Not walking fast, but I'm talking fast. So, um, but I wanted to go on and give you a couple more places in scripture where it says, do not test the Lord. Even Jesus, as they begin his ministry, he referred to this. And in Matthew 4, verse 7, it, said, it says, Jesus told him, it is also written, do not test the Lord your God. And that same gospel story is also told in Luke chapter 4, verse 12. This is where it originated from. Both Exodus and Matthew and Luke. Those are all three referring to the origination of when this command was given. And that's Deuteronomy 6.16. It says, Do not test the Lord your God as you tested him at Massa. So that means that even at the time of testing, in the time of war, in the time of battle, whether you're in need of food or you're in need of water, you know, that's often when we sometimes get grumpy is when we're hungry and thirsty, you know, and we need some renewal and we need some refreshment. But that's when we got to be the most careful. Make sure that we're not testing the Lord, but allow the Lord to prove himself in our test. That's what the Lord had given me tonight, is we're in hot pursuit of God's proving. In other words, when I am going through a test and a trial and I'm walking through it, I'm not going to be detoured and I'm not going to allow myself to stop short of being proven and to see that God is proving himself in the test that I'm walking through. I think I want to give you a new attitude towards your tests and your trials. In fact, the Lord had told me before I came on with you tonight, 
Don't run away from God's testing. It's God's approval. God doesn't set us up for testing and trials and tribulations so that he can show us what failures we are. He's trying to show us how much of him that we've got in us that's going to overcome in that instance. And it's going to make us stronger. It's going to make us more validated, more more uh, getting that he heaven's uh, golden seal of approval in our lives. And God's getting ready really to elevate you and to graduate you into a greater calling. You're going higher, higher, higher. I tell you, I feel like I'm prophesying tonight, and I believe I am, that the Lord has a word for us tonight. And he doesn't want us to be discouraged or despairing because we're going through the trial. Don't look at the trial as something that's trying to be uh, an end to your means. It's a means to your end. It's something that's equipping you and strengthening you and proving to you how much of God is in you. So be, be zealous for that. Be passionate for that. Be in hot pursuit of what God is going to do in and through you in the midst of every opportunity that seems like it's a test, but it's actually an opportunity for God to prove himself in you. Glory to God. And then I wrote down this too because I felt like the Lord really did have a prophetic uh, spent on you know, or a bent on this tonight. And uh, I heard in the, in the spirit as I would be saying this to you tonight that the enemy wants us to identify with the testing as a judgment or a failure. In other words, when you're going through a test, Maybe it's even when you're sick and you're having a lot of pain, no matter what you're going through. Maybe it's finances when you've been as faithful as you can be, and yet you still seem like you're robbing from Peter to pay Paul, and you don't know what to do to even bring everything into balance and to bring everything back into the black and get out of the red. You don't know what it's, why this test is being allowed to you. Maybe it's a relationship. Maybe it's relationships with other people. And you don't know why that there has been a rift that's come about when you did everything that you could do to do right. And still there was a rift that came about. I tell you, God wants to work in those situations and he doesn't want it to be a failure. God's desire for a test is to catapult you into higher levels of maturity in his faithfulness. You just be faithful to what God's told you to do and see that, and I'm going to prophesy this and say, yea and amen, and thus saith the Lord. When, when you feel that way, you just stay faithful and watch God do a work in the other people to reconcile them back to you. There will be a day of healing, just as we need healing in our own physical bodies individually at time. There will be a healing that's coming to the body of Christ because of those that walk in faithfulness. So don't be despairing. It's up to you right now to having done all to stand, stand therefore. Stand with the balance and the equity of the Lord, knowing that what he has told you you're not shrinking back from, and ultimately the people will respect you for that, okay? Uh, God knows how much we can take and always provides a way of escape. Sometimes the smartest thing to do is to run, but you're always looking for an open door. Now that's in reference to that 1 Corinthians chapter 10 verse 13, that said no temptation, which means testing, which means tribulation, but for our common sense of, you know, like I said, this is already like a courtroom scene, and, and Paul's giving exhibit A and exhibit B, and he's saying these are examples from the Old Testament, and so I believe that it really does have a testing, so there is an examination going on, a testing going on. But no testing has overtaken you except what is common to humanity. God is faithful. He's so faithful. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And he will not allow you to be tempted, tested, tried, examined, 
have tribulation beyond what you are able to bear. But with the temptation, he will also provide a way of escape so that you will be able to bear it. That applies to any kind of testing in your life. But they're using really here as an example here about sexual immorality. Now you think of this. Really throughout scripture, the, the union between a husband and a wife, the sexual union, is an analogy of how God wants us to be intimate with him. He wants us to become one with him. And so when we have this as an example of a testing that we fall out of unity with the Lord, it's a great revelation of really sexual immorality being a sinful immorality that estranges the bride of Christ and those that are set apart for God that are betrothed to him, that, that they are estranged from God. And they're choosing to love themselves instead of living sanctified, knowing that they're still living for him and not for the pleasures of their own self. So sexual immorality is a great picture of sanctification throughout the word of God. And again, sometimes, like I've mentioned here, we've got to run. We've got to look for the way of escape. Flee. Run away from it. And if, I'm going to uh, also give you with this 1 Corinthians, so same book, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, so just a couple of chapters before, 18 through 20. It says, run, do not pass, do not stop and get paycheck or whatever, run, don't even think about it, don't, don't, uh, don't look and see anything else, don't evaluate it, oh, do I have enough? Of this, do I have enough money? Just get out of wherever you are. In other words, it's it's crucial. It, it's a it's an emergency. It's urgent. Don't think about anything else. Get out of there. And so, run from sexual immorality. Every sin a person can commit is outside the body. On the contrary, the person who is sexually immoral sins against his own body. Verse nineteen says. Don't you know that your body is a sanctuary of the Holy Spirit? So this is living sanctified. God wants us to live sanctified. Like I mentioned to you, I think last week, I, I taught a course at a Bible uh, conference. Uh, the one, this one in particular was up at Scottsdale Bible Church. And they asked me to teach about ministering single and uh, you know what, I, as I taught that, I thought right now the bride of Christ is still sanctified, betrothed, and engaged in us, so to speak. But we have not had the marriage supper of the Lamb yet, but yet we're betrothed for him. And uh, so really the bride of Christ is a single woman in ministry <laughs> in a very much the same way as I am. So I look for my needs my physical needs and everything to be satisfied, but yet it's something that I am living sanctified in, not trying to satisfy now, but allowing the Lord to be my satisfaction, allowing the love that I have for the Lord to be the one that keeps me from any immorality. You know, I want to flee. And so I tell you, my for myself, I don't listen to romance songs. It's not that they're really bad in themselves. You know, there's a lot of puppy dog kind of songs, you know, that are just sweet little love songs. And there's really nothing wrong with that. Uh, but on the other hand, for myself, if I start listening to a lot of songs like that, it makes me start wanting something that God's not providing in my life right now. I don't have a husband. I'm not engaged to a man, you know, a regular human man. And so I don't want my mind to go that way. So I flee from that. I don't concentrate on it. It doesn't mean that if somebody turns something on in the car that I jump out of the car. No, but I don't just dwell on it. I don't watch a lot of uh, romantic comedies or a lot of romantic movies in general because before long, I'm like, why don't I have somebody? I'm all by myself. You know, so I don't allow myself to go there. I flee from that. In other words, I cut that off and I don't go that way. 
I go towards the way that God is having provisions in my life. My At this point in my life, and I'm not saying, you know, that I will never marry. If the heavens opened and the angels sing, I would be willing to get married. But I still, you know, right now where I'm at, I have to find that my satisfaction is in the Lord. And I'm not going to go the ways of the flesh or satisfying that myself. You know, whenever we do things out of God's timing, it puts us in a position where we are starting to provide for ourselves. I mentioned, I think before to you, you know, that's why we accrue, you know, credit card debt and different things is because we want what really should be provided for tomorrow. We want it today. And that's the same thing with sexual immorality. Okay. So, um, I'm going to go on here in verse, uh, I kind of stopped in the middle of verse 19, so I'm going to read the whole verse again to put it in context. 1 Corinthians 6, 19. Don't you know that your body is a sanctuary, sanctified, of the Holy Spirit, who is in you, whom you have from God? You are not your own. I don't, I don't belong to myself. For you were bought at a price, therefore glorify God in your body. Uh, I'll tell you, uh, about two weeks ago, uh, my nephew, Ian, was doing something I thought was a little dangerous. He was on some roller skates, and he was going at high speeds, and I kind of took him aside for a moment. I said, Ian, and Ian has really got a call on him to be a minister, to be a praise and worship leader. He plays f phenomenal keyboard and other instruments. He's a psalmist of the Lord. But he's, but he's 17. And so I said, you know, Ian, your body doesn't just belong to you. I know it's exciting and everything, but take care of yourself because your body really belongs to the Lord. I wanted to share that with you because it's not just about sex. It's about, in general, how do we take care of ourselves for the Lord? I'm trying to do everything I can to be as healthy as possible for the Lord. And so now I know the Lord has set me up where he can do a miracle. Because after you've done everything you can do, and you've sanctified yourself unto the Lord, the Lord is going to be the one who covers you, and he's going to prove himself. You know, God is constant throughout Scripture that if He get, puts us in the middle of a test, it's He that is going to be the one who is being proved or proven. Or He has approved Himself in you. Glory to God. Be encouraged tonight. You are special. You know, I, I was thinking too before I came on with you tonight. God loves you guys so much that uh, he would put you on my heart every day and have you be part of my prayers. I pray in tongues every day uh, I, if for about an hour or so. Uh, and I I'm going out in the sun every day. And as I'm praying in tongues, I pray for you guys. And I want you to know, my heart is so full of how much God loves you. And he wants to let you know that he's proving himself through your tests and your trials, so that you can be well approved. He's proving himself. Okay, so the difference between testing and proving is we are not to test God, but he proves himself when we are tested. And I want to take you uh, into a story that was about the 23,000. So if you look with me into Numbers, the 25th chapter, and I'm going to read it out of my Jewish Bible. This is a stone edition Tanakh. And I really like it because especially for the Old Covenant, it gives good rabbinical commentary, Midrash. And uh, so I wanted to start at the beginning and you'll see why. I especially am going to be aiming towards verse 6. But we need to understand the context and where stories sit. Because to fully, really, you know, grasp what God is saying in the instance or in the example. Like a while ago I was saying Paul was bringing forth examples like he was in a test case. You know, and he was giving his different exhibits. 
Um, so when you look at Numbers 25, we need to start at the beginning of the chapter. And you'll often hear me say that we are going to see where this is couched. In other words, where our key verses are sitting. They're couched somewhere. And so I will tell you where those key verses are, starting with verse 6. But I'm going to start with verse 1 as far as reading. Israel settled in the Shittim, and the people began to commit harlotry with the daughters of Moab. They invited the people to the feast of their gods. The people ate and prostrated themselves to their gods. Now, do you remember Paul said they got up to eat and drink? Israel became attached to Baal Peor, and the wrath of Hashem flared up against Israel. Now, Baal Peor, one of the idols there made by hands, created by man's hands as an object of creation, when God wants us to worship the invisible God, whose hand and by his word he created us. Verse 4 says, Hashem said to Moses, Take all the leaders of the people, hang them before Hashem, against the sun and the flaring wrath of Hashem will withdraw from Israel. So in verse five, Moses said to the judges of Israel, let each man kill his men who are attached to Baal Peor. Verse six, behold, a man of the children of Israel came and brought a Midianite woman near to his brothers in the sight of Moses and in that sight of the entire assembly of the children of Israel. And they were weeping. Let's see. I lost my place. And they were weeping at the entrance of the tent of meeting. Now what was so bad here in the commentary from this stone edition Tanakh, which Tanakh is the whole Old Testament, uh, is he did this, a man, a Jewish man, brought a Medianite woman. Now, again, this is all part of the worship. Uh, part of the idol, idol worship was to have sexual orgies around, uh, uh, you know, around a god. And so this was the practice of Baal Peor. That's why it was important that we started with verse 1. It's talking about that Israel, when they settled in the land, they began to take on the ways and the worship and the gods of the land and began to commit harlotry. It was part of the idol worship that they were participating in. So in verse 6, when, behold, a man of the children of Israel came and brought a Midianite woman near to his brothers, he is actually saying, I'm going to worship Baal Peor right in front of you, and I'm going to engage in sexual immorality with this woman because this shows that I have you know, enough bravado to do it in front of the elders, to do it right out in public. And that's what uh, the Stone Edition says. It says it was a shocking exhibit of brazenness. A Jew brought his paramour directly to Moses and sinned in public view. Now, I've thought about, you know, in our day, we have a lot of idol worship, whether that be celebrities or whoever, but uh, I really hardly can watch regular TV anymore or watch some of the celebrity singers anymore because uh, you might as well be watching a sex act. You might as well be watching this being done in public. And uh, that just grieves my heart. It grieves the Holy Spirit inside me to see that. And so this is what happened. I'm looking at verse 7 now in Numbers 25. Phinehas, son of Eleazar, son of Aaron, the Kohen. So he's in the Aaronic priesthood. So this was not just um, another man in the camp. This was, this was part of the priesthood that knew God wanted to bring judgment and to set things back right into sanctified living not as unto idols, but unto the one true God. So he said, stood up in the front, in from, um, and he stood up from amid the assembly and took a spear in his hand. He followed the Israelite man into the tent and pierced them both. 
and the Israelite man and the woman into her stomach and the plague. Now, listen, this, I'm not telling you to go out and kill people, but I'm telling you that God wants us to live sanctified and he wants us to take the sword of the Lord. And when we carry the sword of the Lord to bring judgment instead of us bringing judgment, it will pierce even to the inner parts of a person. That's the principles here that God's bringing forth in his word. But it says here, the plague was halted from the children of Israel. There was a plague and the indication here is in context, in the story, where it's couched, so to speak is that there was a sexual disease going around, a sexual plague, but because this priest said, I'm going to sanctify the people and I'm not going to allow this to go on, the sword of the Lord, which we can say is a typology of the sword of the Lord and the sword of the Spirit, he halted it. That's how God wants us to halt things. He wants to live sanctified according to his word and according to the sword of the spirit that we have within our mouth to execute justice. And those who died in the plague were 24,000. Now you might remember in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, it said 23,000. Now did Paul get it wrong? Well, theologians debate this and uh, there's different ways that they look at it. But basically the thought is that Paul was just, you know, uh, you know, it could have been 23, five, you know, he, he could have been rounding it up or whatever, but also there's the point that this was made because in first Corinthians, it says that 23,000 died in one day. Could it be that 23,000 died in one day, but 1,000 also died in another day of, because of this plague? You know, maybe 23,000 died on the first day and then another thousand at that point, you know, right after that, you know, as, as the plague died off. So there's diff, but it's close enough. And really what is important is that we're seeing that anything that is not living sanctified unto the Lord as the one true God, as our creator, as the master of the universe, that is where we need to be careful of. And that we need to make sure that we're living in alignment and sanctification so that we can pass the test that God has for us. God's going to prove himself. And I think with that, I want to close by having you go with me into Exodus, the fifth chapter. If you can look over there with me and, uh, I, I'm going to encourage you to read the whole chapter in your own time. Let's see how much the Lord has me le read right now as I'm sharing time with you. So Galatians chapter 5. And you're going to see how this synchronizes with uh, everything that we've been talking about as far as us being created in God's image and then also fleeing sexual immorality. So in verse... 1 of Ephesians 5, the very first thing it says is, Be ye therefore imitators or followers of God. Be in his image. It's calling us back to our originally created purpose. As dear children, see, we're in the image of the Father, and walk in love exactly as Christ the Messiah also has loved us and has given himself for us. And offer a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling savor. But fornication, that's sex outside Mary, or anything that is not of God's covenant way of living, is as far as being intimate, is uh, a fornication. So we, we want to turn away from that. We want to flee away from it. We want to escape that. And all uncleanness or covetousness, let it no way be once named among you. Now verse 4 says, Neither filthiness, nor foolish talking, nor jesting, which are not convenient, but rather giving of thanks. For this we know, that no whoremonger, nor unclean person, nor covetous man, that means wanting something that doesn't belong to you, 
So really somebody that is lustful and looks at another person uh, that they're not married to, uh, looking over at somebody else and wanting them and looking lustfully upon their physical being, that is really an act of covetousness. So it's a, or we could say covetousness is an act of lust as well. So that is something that we don't want to have part of our lives. And then look at this, it says, who is an idolater? Those things that we would allow in our lives that would have to do with sexual immorality and impure, impurities, the shameful things of the body, the things that show us that our body is only debased to that purpose. My body is more than just a sexual being. Now, I want to balance this. You know, if you're married, God has given you the marriage bed and the marriage bed is undefiled, Scripture says. But I'm talking about living sanctified and our purpose is beyond just pleasures in the flesh. And then it says that it has to do with idolatry because we put our feelings, our pleasures above uh, worshiping the Lord and pleasing the Lord. My pleasure and my love is, first of all, primarily to think about what the love of my life, the priority of my life, the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, my Jesus, my Savior, who gave his own body for me. Now all I can do is live for him and give my body for him. Not living to my flesh, not living to satisfy Pamela, but living to satisfy and to do everything I can to take dominion and take his image to the earth. And then it says here, I think, let's see, I am in verse 6. Let no man deceive you with vain words, trying to build you up, trying to think good of your, you know, that you're all that in a bag of chips. <laughs> Don't let somebody give vain words to you and try to schmooze you and try to get you to do things that, so in a way, be good, you have, use good discernment, you know, so because these things cometh the wrath of God, God is unhappy, not because we're his children, God is ha unhappy because when we sell out, it grieves him that we're living be below the inheritance blessings that he has for us. He wants to give us a purpose and a hope. He wants to prove himself in us. And it makes him sad when we sell out and we prostitute ourselves and into the things that we esteem and we're really kind of worshiping before we worship him. Oh, I'm telling you, this is a hard topic tonight. But I'm telling you, it's a prophetic topic because this is something that we need to do to prepare the church for the end times. Okay, now I'm in verse 7. But not uh, be not therefore partakers with them, for ye were sometimes in darkness. Now see how that this refers back to creation? The creation of the world happened because everything was void and in darkness. But it says here, but you are the light. You have found the light in the Lord. Walk as children of the light. Walk as the creation of the Lord that has the image of God in you. Proving, there is my word. <laughs> so we're in hot pursuit of God's proving. Proving what is acceptable unto the Lord. Hallelujah. That's where I'm going to stop tonight. But I encourage you to read the whole chapter. But I want to tell you, God, <laughs> he's wanting to prove himself in you so that you will know that you're the accepted of the Lord, that he is proving himself in you to give you strength to live in a victorious, sanctified life, worshiping him. Next time you're tempted to give in to an act of the flesh, realize that it's something that is akin to putting that above the Lord. You're putting your fleshly desires above the Lord. So live clean. Don't, don't allow the, the enemy to cause you to look back at the dirt you were created from. 
Remember I said that last week to you? The enemy wants us to concentrate on the dirt and the soil that we were created from. And God wants us to look forward and have a vision for the image of God that we're created into. This has been a stiff word tonight. This is I'm calling you to sanctification. I'm calling you to set yourself apart for a holy calling. Don't give in to the ways of the flesh. If you realize that that's akin to idol worship, I think it's going to help some of us become a lot more uh, determined that we will not give in to the ways of the flesh because we'll realize that that's the same as bowing down to an idol. Tough word, huh? Ah, you guys, you're awesome, and I love you. And again, I want you to know God loves me so much, and I realize that. He loves you. Can you say that? God loves me so much. He gave his own son for me. He gave his own body for me. He hurt. He was in pain. He was filled with zeal and passion, though, more zeal and passion for each one of us than he was to release himself from the pain. You know, he could have called 10,000 angels to destroy the world and to set him free, the song goes. But he stayed on the cross and gave his life, his blood, his own body, Every stripe that he received was so that you could have healing, so that you could have salvation, so that you could have wholeness. Lord Jesus, right now, we ask that these words and these things that I share tonight will give us something to think about, Lord, where we can overcome the flesh. We're not going to bow down and worship or allow any fleshly urging to supersede our love for you. And Lord, I ask that maybe for any that have given into the flesh and have had sexual immoralities within their lives, Lord, right now all we need to do is come to the cross and repent and say, I'm fleeing from that. I'm turning away from it. See, that's a part of repentance. Repentance means to turn around and go the opposite way. Well, if you're going to flee from sex, sins, immorality, impurities, other things in our life that draw our flesh, if we're going to turn around and walk away from that, that's repenting. And Jesus will receive you. If you repent and turn again to the Lord your God, he will forgive you. You can start new right now. Right as we're ending this time together right now in Facebook Live, you can start again. This can be a new day for you. You don't have to allow any of the idol worship of sexual impurities or anything else that draw, has drawn you in the flesh. Maybe it's drinking. Maybe it's smoking. Any of those things that seem to have a higher power. Right now we pray for release. You know, uh, smoking won't send you to hell. <laughs> you've probably heard this before. It'll just make you smell like you've been there. You know, but I really don't think that there's any sin that's darker or bigger than all of us. If we have sin, it separated us from God. You know, there there's no black sins and gray sins and beige sins. Sin is sin. Sin is anything that separates us from God. I don't want anything to separate me from God. And I don't want anything to separate you from God. If it's something especially that brings guilt to you, don't let guilt keep you from knowing that the Lord loves you because the love of God is what causes us to serve him. I don't quit smoking. I don't quit sexual immorality because I want to serve the Lord. I serve the Lord and because of that, I want to quit those things. Okay? Uh, I don't want you to be discouraged. I want you to know that God accepts you. Just repent, come to him, and he'll take you just as you are. But he loves you so much that he's not going to leave you that way. Okay? <laughs> I love you guys. Uh, I'm just overwhelmed with love for you and knowing how much God wants to have you in him 
and you in him, and together every test will be an opportunity to 